Good evening, everyone. Uh, you guys can hear me okay? Okay, because I think as a speaker, sometimes you can hear yourself really clearly, but then people in the back are like, I can't hear you. So just want to double check. All right, cool. Um, so my name is Alex Liu, and I work at Netflix. I'm currently on the website UI team, and uh, we're in the middle of moving our website over from a Java stack to a Node.js stack. Um, so it's been a pretty exciting journey so far, and today I'd like to share with everyone some of the stuff that we've been doing around asset packaging specifically. So we're talking about like JavaScript, um, CSS packaging, as well as templating, and how we manage the complexity of that when working with a ton of uh, A-B tests. So to start with a little bit of background, uh, at Netflix we do a ton of A-B testing. And so what that means uh, is you know, we gather data from any A-B test that we run, and then we use that data to figure out how to build an either, even better experience for our users. And when I say that we A-B test, we really do A-B test everything. Uh, so we test everything from our sign-up flow to different types of payments. And we'll even do this type of testing on our member homepage. So there's probably not a single thing on this page that hasn't been tested and retested multiple times. Um, and it's worth noting that not all the tests, uh, especially on, on our member homepage, are UI driven. So for example, um, some things we do test are algorithm based. So the, the ordering of your rows and the contents that show up in those rows uh, can also be A-B tests as well. Some of our tests also allow us to do more revolution instead of evolution. Uh, and so the profiles fe feature, which some of you might be familiar with, um, was a test that was sort of cross-cutting across our entire stack. So we call these tests uh, mountain tests. And what they do is um, they're not just UI-based tests. They're basically across from the front end all the way across to our back end systems. And doing these types of tests allow us to really make sure that we don't A-B test ourselves into a corner, right? So this is a way to sort of think outside of the box. So when people think of A-B testing, uh, they generally think of one or two variations of a single experience. At Netflix, we do what we call multivariate A-B testing, and that means each test not only has uh, multiple cells, but each cell actually has a slightly different experience. Um, so test allocations are done randomly, um, and we also run multiple tests at the same time. So what that means is that any user in our experience is going to get a very unique experience, right? And these allocations are done completely randomly. Um, so the experiences that a user might get are going to be really unique to that specific user. And uh, not one thing to note from this diagram here is that not all customers get allocated to all tests. Uh, these allocations will vary quite widely. So if everyone sort of remembers their math a little bit and we were to sort of pick one of uh, seven possible experiences from each of these sets and calculate the total, total number of unique experiences possible from just these seven tests alone, we'd be looking at a number close to two million different unique experiences. And that's just seven tests, right? Um, and you might think like, wow, that's crazy. That's a lot of experiences. But you know, the reality is that we actually run hundreds of A-B tests every year. So just imagine you know, taking that matrix you saw and multiplying it by about a factor of 100. And that's probably the number of unique experiences you'd end up with. Um, so what that ends up looking like is some, some large, ridiculous number that I wouldn't even know how to say. Um, and this is the number, of experience, the number of unique experiences that we would be serving to our users at any given time. And this is what that complexity distills down into. Uh, these are the number of files that we have for each of the different type of front-end assets we have for the website. Uh, it's pretty crazy, right? I mean, like 2,000 templates. Uh, and these numbers are huge because they represent those unique experiences that we just saw. So if we were to sort of guesstimate and say that the typical asset package on our website for, say, a JavaScript or a CSS package contains maybe you know, 30 to 50 different files, um, what that means is that we're going to be serving about 2.5 million unique packages every week. Um, so we have one push per week, and we're generating these new packages for every single push that we have. Um, so it's a staggeringly large number. Um, and the crazy thing about this is that this number is only going to grow bigger, right? Like the more tests that we have, the more experiences that we have out there, the larger the number of unique packages that we'll have. 
So that results in unique payloads for our HTML, our CSS, and our JavaScript packages. And I think at this point, you know, the problem of scale becomes immediately clear, right? Like, how do you even begin to manage all the different experiences that you have to serve on a website? And it's a really good question, because that's exactly the problem that we're trying to solve here. Uh, since we do do all this A-B testing, and it's, it's just a huge number, we need to be able to not only quickly determine the experience that you should be getting, but then to actually serve it out to you, right? Um, and what it boils down to really is a problem of conditional dependencies. Or in the case of templates, you might have like conditional inclusions or conditional partials. And so as we kind of dive into this talk, uh, I just wanted to say that it's worth noting that this AB problem and the AB complexity is not a new problem for us, right? Like AB testing is very, very core to the Netflix DNA, and it's something we've been doing for a very long time. Um, I think what's interesting here is that, uh, you know, with our recent migration to Node, we've had a really great opportunity to sort of, you know, reevaluate and rethink this, the way that we've been doing things. And um, for anybody who hasn't worked in Node yet, or well, I mean, actually, how many of you have, have worked in Node? Okay, a couple. Sorry? Have worked in Node. Oh, okay, much better. Whew, I was like, five people? Man, okay. Um, no, that's good. So, you know, hopefully I'm not, I'm not parroting something that everybody already knows, but, you know, the, the Node philosophy borrows very heavily from the Unix, Unix philosophy, right? Which is, uh, you know, build super small specialized modules that do one thing, but do it really, really well. And so what that means is you, in practice, you end up building a ton of really small modules that maybe don't do a lot by themselves in a vacuum, but you might be able to compose them and build them together, string them together to do something that's really, really cool. So with that context set, uh, I figured let's go ahead and start to look through how we used uh, some interesting modules and concepts to solve our AB dependency problem. So templating, uh, everyone should be pretty familiar with this if you've worked in front end at all. It's uh, central to any web-based UI. And you can make things really pretty with CSS and you know, flash it up with JavaScript, but ultimately if you don't have a good foundation for your templates, you're going to be in for a lot of pain. So as a good example, let's uh, take a look at A-B testing payments today. So here's what that template might start off looking like. Pretty simple, right? Of course, uh, it always does start off simple. So we're testing the payment method, and um, for A-B testing, we found it really important to actually test all possible variations in the UI. And so what that means is that um, we need to be able to test all the different possible combinations of the variables that we're testing in order to better fully understand why a certain experience won. So for a case of a payment test like this, one thing we might want to test is the order, right? This tells us if people are actually just picking the first option that was presented on that page. And so to do that, we might actually want to create several variations of this experience. So we might add you know, the addition of a direct debit um, probably not available in the US, but uh, for some of our LATAM uh, countries. And so you might add direct debit as a potential thing, and then you might, you, you'll notice here that we've got the credit card option collapsed, right? But you might have experience where perhaps direct debit is collapsed and the credit card one is open, and you might switch the orders, and you can start to see where I'm going with this. But um, you might think that it's perhaps like borderline minutia here, but ultimately we found that you should never really second guess your users. So now that we have five or six variations, this is what your template might end up looking like, right? Um, and this is pretty terrible. I mean, I think anybody who has to work in this template is going to do everything in their power to actively avoid working in this template. And this is what that might look like if we try to visualize this. We've got this parent template, and then we've got all this logic that's inside of this template, right? So we have these if checks, we determine what experience they are in, we de determine what cell they're in for a given test, and then we give them the correct template. Now, a smart engineer might come along and say, hey, you know, like, I see a lot of duplicated stuff in there. We can probably pull some of that out, create some common partials here, and that's pretty good, right? Like, all these experiences do have a common credit card experience and a common debit, debit card 
partial, so let's uh, extract those out, which is great. So now you get something that looks like this. Um, so we've moved the comment portions out, but that core logic is still in that parent template, right? So you might say, well, why don't we break that logic out as well? And sure, that works right here, but um, what's actually happened here, right? Like you've now taken one template with a lot of logic into it and sharded it out into now potentially six different templates with six different logic paths, right? Um, and so now your logicless templates are really not so logicless and you're just in a really bad place. So ultimately what we really want is something that looks like this, right? It's straightforward, it's simple, it says, hey, here's your payment method. And your template just asks for a, for a template method and the system somehow just figures it out and gives you the correct experience. So the real trick here is how we actually determine that experience. So here's how we can make this work, right? We've got our, our payment template that comes in and says, all right, I'm going to ask for a payment type, and then something somewhere in that system needs to figure out, you know, what the correct experience should be for that given user. And of course, this needs to be flexible enough, right, to work for all users regardless of whether or not they're in the test, and um, not just the control cell, obviously, but all the other different cell experiences as well. And it turns out that this question mark can be something as simple as a JSON file. So here's what that might look like. Uh, we've got a basically what we think is a mapping layer that will determine the correct template that the user should get with each choice being backed by a rule attribute. So you see uh, that this is essentially an array of rules here. Um, and then each one, each rule is evaluating to a template name. So when a developer asks for a specific template name, um, we'll run that rule and then whichever rule returns true will be the template that that user gets. So to help generate and manage these rules, we've built a module. Um, this will be the first of many modules that I'll introduce to you guys tonight. And you know, just before you go on a wild goose chase, we haven't actually open sourced any of these yet, um, but we are thinking about it and something we would like to do. So um, if you are interested, you know, please come and uh, chat with us afterwards. So here's an example of that rule that we saw in the mapping file. Um, so the rule is pretty simple, and it can be as simple or as complex as you need it to be. Um, as long as whatever you're testing for can be boiled down to a Boolean value, you can make it a rule. So you'll see here in uh, this example here that um, basically all we're doing is checking for a test variable, um, which says, hey, am I in test, you know, test number 10? And if you are, then just return true. And so you notice that there's a callback here, so that means these rules can be async, but uh, generally we do want to avoid doing that um, during the rendering lifecycle. So the second part of this equation is a custom template resolver. And this is what a normal uh, template inclusion path might look like, right? So you have your parent dust template here. We use dust, um, in case that wasn't clear. But we use dust, so dust, uh, sorry, our parent template will ask for a child template, right? And then usually Dust will go and look on your file system or look wherever and say, here's the partial that you asked for. Um, in order to make the system work, what we've actually had to do is to hijack that request to Dust. Um, so what we'll do is take that request and send it to our custom resolver module. And what this module does is really just look at that JSON file that we saw earlier. It will then resolve and evaluate those rules. And once those rules are run, it will determine the correct partial that should be returned to that parent template. So now this partial is, is picked up and returned all the way back to our resolver, which goes back to dust, and then back to our parent template. So pretty cool, right? That means that we can move from something like this ultimately to this, which is much easier and much more saner to read. So there's a ton of big wins here for us uh, on just the templating side. And the cool thing, I think, is the rules, because they're really, really flexible, but they can also be really, really simple or as complex as you need them to be. And what's also neat is that they can be combined dynamically on the fly. So you can create you know, a ton of rules and then say, hey, I'm just going to create a new rule that is a combination of these two rules and combine them together. Um, so we can create new combinations on the fly. <coughs> Secondly, by abstracting all these rules out to a separate file, 
templates can become a lot more legible, right? Your templates are no longer logic driven. And I think anybody who spent a lot of time like in your logic trying to match up if blocks and else blocks and closing and opening brackets is just, it's, it's a terrible place to be in. And lastly, we can reuse these templates more often. And I think this is really nice because what the rules do is allow us to break up templates into much smaller atomic pieces. And we can re reuse these templates pretty much anywhere we want to. And as long as that template is backed by a rule that will resolve to, you know, correctly for that user, then there's never a fear of like, you know, putting a template and then having it show up in a place where you don't expect it to show up. So we think this is a fairly compelling solution to the spaghetti template problem. Um, as we move into JavaScript and CSS packaging, you'll see some of these similar concepts applied there as well. So one of the driving uh, guidelines that we set for ourselves as we started on this journey is really the concept of modules. And we wanted to make everything a module, right? Um, we're, not, we're not talking just about JavaScript here, but for CSS as well. And modules come with a ton of benefits, right? Like they reduce global. You get, in JavaScript at least, you get a more true private public uh, you know, differentiation for your message. You get a true import export system for your code as well. And lastly, because you are using modules, you can now use uh, static tools to build dependency trees. Now, that might not seem that interesting right now, but um, it's actually a pretty core piece of our system. And so I know some of you are probably thinking like, oh, modules, like whatever, I'm really old school, I can manage my namespaces, I don't need no module system. Um, which is great, <laughs> but you run the risk of having small changes creating disastrous consequences, right? And I think as a front-end engineer, I would, you know, we probably all would like to think that we're past the days where a single error, you know, in your JavaScript takes down that entire page. So just like for templating, um, let's walk through an A-B test together. So let's say now that we're A-B testing search, right? So like all web pages, we need to send a JavaScript package down to the user. So here's our top level app.js file. And ideally, you know, if you are in the old search experience, then you will get the dependencies that are required only for old search. And likewise, you know, if you get allocated into new search experience, you should get only the dependencies that are required for new search. So let's take a look at you know, the contents of your actual app file. So here, um, in case you're not familiar, this is the ES6 module syntax. Uh, we've been using it at Netflix with quite some success. Um, ultimately, not that important, but you know, you should just know that the file here is basically asking for three hard dependencies, which is jQuery, your old search experience, and your new search experience. And import statements like this are really great on the server, right? Like anybody who works on the server-side code, you basically import the entire world, but you might only end up using like perhaps a fraction of the things that you've required in because things are different for every user, right? Um, but on client-side JavaScript, that's not as straightforward. And so a common strategy for sort of handling this thing is to sort of bundle packages and then uh, packages that include all your possible dependencies and send them down the wire, right? So if you're using like RJS Optimizer or Browserify or any of those other bundling solutions, this is probably what you do today. But we do have a problem here, right? As we previously saw, we have about like 700 something JavaScript files in our repository. And if you go down the path of bundling everything, we'd be looking at, you know, 700 something files and a package that's probably like 2.5 megs, right? Um, this is not something that's really gonna work for us that well. And you know, we, as you saw earlier, like these, we're generating a ton of packages and we don't want to be get in the business of sort of pre-generating these packages, right? Like you might say like, well, let's just pre-generate some packages, but you have all these unique experiences. Are you really gonna go through you know, every possible permutation and generate a package for each user? So ultimately, this is not really a solution that works out that well for us. So some of you are probably thinking, then why not ask for your stuff async, right? Um, you know, you've got 
require JS and AMD, you can just ask for the things that you want conditionally on the client. So uh, sure, that, that's another way to go. So the user comes and asks for your top level app file. You know, the app will go back and then we'll determine you know, that the user needs old search and then all the sub dependencies of old search and so on and so forth. Um, so right off the bat, you'll sort of see here that the solution requires a lot of serial requests. You know, for just this example here, we're seeing like you know four serial requests just to get all the dependencies required. And you know, for a really complex page, that tree might actually be even deeper. And another problem that might not be immediately obvious here is that this pushes a lot of con contextual information about your modules and your module dependencies down into the client, right? Because that means the browser not only needs to know about the tree, but it needs to be able to resolve that dependency tree, right? So you'll get old search and you know, somewhere in your system needs to know, oh, old search requires all these dependencies and old search and sub dependencies require these dependencies. So that's all additional complexity you're pushing down to the browser. So ultimately that's, that's not really something we want to be doing either. So I think at this point it's worth reiterating the problem, which is a problem of conditional dependencies. Um, what we want to be able to do is to build a package that's specifically tailored for a user you know, based on their unique allocation of A-B tests. And we want to do it in a way that you know, doesn't force them to download files that they don't need, um, but also doesn't force them to wait to get the files that they do need, right? So if a user comes to the site, we should be able to figure out, hey, what's your experience? What are the files that you should get? And we should be able to deliver it to them in one go. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and reevaluated some of the assumptions that we made. You know, most of the solutions and the ones that we just saw as well try to tackle this problem primarily from a client side perspective, right? And that makes a lot of sense. We're, we're all front end engineers, we do all of our stuff in the browser. But we thought really hard about this and we realized something, right? We've got this thing called a server. The server knows all about the context of the user. The server knows all about the dependency tree of these modules. So why not leverage the server to do some work, right? Like that information is already available to you there. There's no reason not to do that resolution on the server as opposed to on the client. And so we found two places where we could divide that work up. Um, the first step would be at build time uh, using Gulp and static analysis. Gulp is uh, a, a build tool that we use. Um, it's very similar to Grunt if you haven't used it. And the second part would be um, doing some additional work at request time. So this is when we actually generate the response for a page that the user asks for. And it turns out that just using these two hooks, we were actually able to uh, build a collection of small NPM modules to solve this very problem for us. So the first of our modules here is NF include when. Um, this module aims to solve the most basic question, which is how do we know when a module is conditional? So we went the path of using annotations. Uh, so for example here, old search, which we looked at earlier, um, has a comment annotation here that says, you should include me in a package only when the user is not in the new search test. And likewise, for the new search test, uh, that file also has an annotation that says, include me in the package only when the user is in the new search test. And this is kind of nice, right? Because ultimately you have this comment that is in the code and the code becomes official truth. And again, this is what the implementation of that rule looks like. Looks pretty familiar, right? This is exactly what we saw earlier for the rules that we use in our templating system. So this is kind of a great example of where we previously didn't have a lot of code reuse. But you know, building like these really, really small modules that don't do a lot allows us to reuse similar concepts across different parts of our stack. Our next module is the asset registry. And this is part of the bucket that does some work at build time. So coming back to our app.js for a moment here, um, as long as, assuming like all the, the modules here, old search and new search, are requiring their own dependencies, so you're being explicit about all your dependencies in the tree, then that means what we can do is uh, do static analysis of all of our files at build time. And we can do that to basically build out some dependency trees. 
So if you just think of it like this, we've got you know, app.js and its files and pretty much every file in our repo, right? They all get sucked in at build time and Gulp does a bunch of magical stuff here and analyzes and walks that dependency tree um, and ultimately all of that is serialized into a JSON object and stored, on the, and stored somewhere, right? Whether that's um, at build time, most likely on the file system. And what we, what we call this is a registry. So this would be an asset registry and we do this for both of our JavaScript and our CSS as well. So we'll take a look at what that looks like. Um, for example, here is a entry for app.js inside the registry. So you'll see we've got two attributes here. We've got the depths attribute, um, and this looks exactly like what we saw earlier, right? We're basically just parsing out the imports or require statements from that specific module. You'll notice the second one, the second attribute is an attribute called depths full. And what this actually represents is the fully flattened dependency tree for app.js. So if you think of the registry as being sort of a dictionary for all the modules in your repository, right? You can, so equivalently we've got, um, you know, a entry here for, for new search as well. What we've done is basically walk that tree, figure out what all the dependencies are required for that file and continue walking it until we've got all your dependencies and then collapse that list. So what that means is that if I'm asking for new search JS, I need to have all of those depths in the depths full attribute. And so if you're, you know, observant, you'll notice that the definition here uh, for new search has an extra attribute that's not in the app.js attribute, or sorry, not in the app.js entry, and that's the rule attribute. Um, and yep, that rule attribute in new search is the rule that was parsed out of that comment annotation as well. Yep, right there. And so our last module, our packager, is what brings together all of these pieces. Um, you might have noticed we're extremely creative with our module names. So the API is uh, fairly straightforward here. We've got a packager, um, we've got the include when rules we saw earlier, and our registry, right? And we basically toss them all to the packager and we say, hey, give me a package definition for app.js. And so the first thing that the packager will do is actually go to the registry and ask for the definition of the file that you've asked for, right? So we'll, we've asked for app.js and we'll return you the depths full attribute, which is all the files that are required for app.js to work correctly. Secondly, we'll take a look at all these files and we'll figure out like which of these files actually have, you know, rules associated with them, right? And we saw that old search and new search, which should be mutually exclusive, right? Because you would never be in both experience at the same time. Those are the only files in here that have rules associated with them. So we'll, what, what, we'll, blah, what we'll want to do is execute and evaluate these rules. Um, so for example, if this user was in the new search experience, we would say, hey, they're not eligible for the, um, old search experience, and so we'll take that out. But you are in the new search experience, so we will keep that in the package. Now the registry is also smart enough to know that once old search has been removed, we can remove old search's sub-dependencies as well. So we can go through the system and remove those as well. Ultimately what you're left with is a package that has just the files that you need. Right? And so we've removed all of our conditional dependencies here, and we can just take this array here, concatenate the files, and serve them out to the user. So that was a lot of information, so I think it'll be useful here to do a quick uh, visual recap. So we have our repository, which goes through a build system, and we generate registries that represent the state of our repository. And then ultimately these registries are passed to our node app. And then at request time, now that node, our node app has these registries, when a user comes and asks for a specific package, we can look up that definition in the registry, get all the files the user needs, evaluate any rules, and then return just the correct files back to that user. And of course, once this package is served the first time, you know, we'll cache it to the CDN. So that means any subsequent users that come back and ask for that same package, uh, and they happen to be in the same allocation of tests, we've already generated that package and the CDN will serve it. So 
So in the end, we were able to solve a pretty complex client-side problem, you know, by leveraging the server at both build time and request time. Um, you know, for us, the big takeaway here was that we could do a lot at build time, right? And you would much rather take that penalty at build time than you would at request time. And just just because you know you know we're all front end and we love working in the browser, like doesn't mean you shouldn't leverage your server, right? Um, you have a server; it's there. Use it. Um, and I think. You know, for anybody who works in a lot of JavaScript, we tend to get sort of stuck in this thing like, oh, we don't need to compile, we don't need to do this stuff, but hey, you know, sometimes you can get some pretty cool stuff from doing that. And sort of as a corollary to that, that previous point, um, you can compose lots of these small modules that we've built, and if you just think about like how little each of these things do by themselves in a vacuum, right, like something that just resolves a Boolean value to, you know, something that just builds dependency trees, and then the packager, which basically combines all these small things and then creates a really compelling solution for us, um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty compelling way to build things. Great. So after all is said and done, uh, I think we were able to actually do a bunch of other really additional cool things uh, using just these modules that we've seen. So even though they aren't directly related to the conditional dependencies problem, um, I think they're pretty compelling and cool enough that you should just uh, go ahead and take a look. Bonus round. So we were really um, surprised by the way we were able to leverage the registry. We originally designed the registry really just to build the dependency tree, right? We wanted to know what our packages looked like when you wanted to pick just a single entry point. So in the case that we saw earlier, app.js was our entry point. Um, but we discovered along the way that we could really leverage and use this registry to great effect to do lots of other really cool things. So here's the registry definition again. Um, there's some extra stuff in here I've added. These, this is actually all part of the build time step. Um, I left them out earlier because we really wanted to focus just on the dependency portion of it. But uh, what you'll notice here is that there's a couple new attributes. Um, so I left out uh, the rule depths and depth pool stuff because we saw that earlier. But there's a depths count attribute. Um, and what that's doing is actually doing reference counting for your dependencies. And that's counting those dependencies all the way down the tree. Uh, this is what allows us to you know, very quickly resolve when sub-dependencies can be pruned. Right? We saw earlier that we didn't want old switch anymore, so we took that out of the package but we need to be able to figure out whether or not old switch dependencies could be safely pruned. So you know, by doing dependency counting here, we can quickly do a lookup and just say, oh, um, is there anybody else requiring those sub-dependencies? If not, take them out. Um, that keeps us from having to re-resolve that dependency tree at request time, which can be pretty expensive. And the other thing you'll notice here is at the very bottom, we've got uh, two attributes here that say file size and file size pool. And what that represents is, um, the, fir the first one, file size, just represents the file size of the actual file in question. So for, for this file, it would be the rating history model. Um, and file size pool will actually represent the size of your complete package. So that's basically all the files in depth pool collapsed and concatenated together. And this is kind of neat, right? Like this is all happening at build time. So that means you can, you know, if you wanted to build some script that, you know, goes through all of the registry entries and says, like, what's the largest size uh, package that I've got? And then if you have a page that starts to serve out really, really large JavaScript packages, you can sort of walk through this registry to figure out who the offending file is. Uh, in our CSS, we do pretty similar things. Um, so we use Less's import reference directive, which basically lets us uh, import CSS files. Um, whether, so, so in this context, what import really means is just it's expecting some other file to be included in the package before it. And it you know, works a lot like the JavaScript modules. And so we do that to build CSS dependency trees. So we've got a CSS registry, looks pretty much exactly the same. The only thing different here might be uh, this extra CSS attribute, which tells us, hey, for this package, you are going to get you know, eight selectors or you know, six declaration blocks. And this is all really, really neat stuff, right? Like you can do, oops, sorry. You can do a lot of stuff like um, doing uh, a perf analysis, so figuring out like, whether or not you've exceeded you know, 
number of media queries or selector counts. And uh, for people who are still having to support IE, um, whether or not your file has over 4,000 selectors in your file. Because if you have over 4,096 selectors in a single file, I think IE8 barks and then doesn't want to load it at all. So it's a good sign. All right, so the best part of all this system, um, which we haven't gotten to yet, actually, is, is this. Uh, the registry also contains a cache of the actual contents of all of our files. Probably wondering, like, why? Like, well, I don't get it. Why would you do something like this? Uh, as it turns out, the registry concept can be extended to all of the front end assets in our repository. So if you recall, we've got our template files, right? We've got the mappings for our template files, which is the, uh, the stuff that handles that the condi conditional inclusions in our templates. And then we've got our JavaScript and our CSS. So these, these registries are all inclusive, right? Um, they basically contain a dictionary of all the files in our repository. They contain the dependency trees for every single file. They contain metadata that's required to resolve their conditional inclusion as part of the package. And then they also have the complete contents of that file. So what that means is actually these four registries right here represent the complete UI for our entire website in just these four files. So what we can do then is take these registries, oops, sorry, bundle them up into you know, a UI bundle somewhere and deploy them out to the cloud um, or deploy them to the CDN if you want. And you know, over time, you might start to have multiple UI bundles. And you know, when our node instances come up, they'll simply fetch the requisite bundle for that specific build and pull it down and use it. And so some of you might be wondering why we bother with the complexity of deploying these bundles out to the cloud, right? Like why not just deploy it with your app? Um, what it means is that we can actually deploy UI bundles anytime, right? So if you've got a change in just your templates, your JavaScript, or your CSS, we just, you know, we build those, we deploy them, and then our app can dynamically pull those down uh, from the web and then just use them. And we don't even have to restart our servers because it's all just, the registry files are just JSON, right? <coughs> and so since these registries are, uh, are just JSON and we load them into memory, what that means is that we never touch the file system when we serve out responses to the user. So uh, not for templates and not for JavaScript, not for CSS. And we're able to do this because uh, for stuff like templates, right, um, they're strings. And so when we read in that, that JSON registry, we'll just store them as strings in memory. And then for stuff like JavaScript and CSS, because they're never actually consumed in a meaningful way on the server, what we do is actually use uh, node buffers. And we store those as buffers. And then that means we can just type them out uh, to the response really, really quickly. And so you're thinking like, okay, that, that's pretty fast. So you know, what, what are we looking at in terms of serving out a package? Um, to serve a conditional JavaScript or CSS package, our server takes less than five milliseconds right now. And so that means it's actually, that's five milliseconds inclusive of resolving your conditions and for actually the server you know, taking the response like saying, here's everything you need and then typing it out. Of course, there's going to be additional time to, you know, for the user to actually download that file. But you know, as far as doing the best that we can on the server, I think this is a pretty amazing number. So I think the biggest takeaway here is that you know, just because we write JavaScript doesn't mean we can't benefit from a lot of static analysis. You know, like I said before, we get used to living in a compile-free world. Um, but you know, there are some pretty neat things that we can do with this. Um, and as a result, you know, we've been able to build a pretty awesome solution, we think, to our AD problem. And so kind of wrapping up, I uh, just want to share some of our learnings as we built out this solution. Uh, it might, some of this might uh, sound like common or uh, things you've heard of, but nonetheless, I think there are things that we found really valuable. The first being that multivariate testing is extremely complex, uh, especially in the UI. And uh, you know, I think we've learned a lot by just taking a just do it approach. Um, so the asset packaging stuff that we've talked about today, um, at the time that I wrote the slide deck, I think we were on version three. We're now at probably like 
3.5 and 4 is sort of in the pipeline. You know, this thing is always evolving. And, you know, I think this just through attitude can sometimes lead to some really interesting things. So, for example, the registry, right? Like, we totally didn't think of that as a way to dynamically deploy UIs because we just wanted a way to, to build our dependency trees, but ultimately led to some pretty cool stuff. And this is sort of our take on the ever popular fail fast, uh, fail often. Um, and in this case, of course, we don't actually mean fail in a way that, you know, impacts the customer, right? Um, but rather that we want to build solutions, we want to roll them out, we want to be able to test them, and then figure out if they work. Uh, you know, we don't want to, and we, we would actually rather find out that something doesn't work sooner rather than later. So there's this, there's this really apt quote from Thomas Edison. He says, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Uh, and, and I think the, the sort of the point of this year is to really avoid becoming like a, a whiteboard or armchair architect. I think oftentimes we get stuck in these rooms where we're debating like, oh, we should totally do it A, or like, no, your idea is dumb, like we should do it this way. Um, I think ultimately it's the one that ships that wins, right, and the one that works out in practice. And so it's just like, just go and build it, right, and then test it. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, you know, keep evolving. And the last point, uh, just simplify. Keep things simple. Um, keep your modules small, and then break down as much of that complexity as possible into smaller modules. Um, yep, hopefully some of you guys were blown away. Uh, <laughs> if not, um, thanks for coming. <laughs>